boxing and show show times and show box series. So I'm going to kick it off with Steve. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank everybody for coming. This is such a great and original idea. This film festival. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel here on my farthest right or furthest right. Lorraine Price, who is the co-director of the movie we just saw, Last Woman Standing. Uh, for those of you who are just arriving now and have not seen the movie that we just screened, it was a fascinating story about two uh, Olympic uh, hopefuls who happened to fight in the same weight class, two women fighters, who knew each other very well, befriended each other, and then they found out only one of them could go to the Olympics. And that's the, the uh, uh, theme book behind the movie. Uh, to Lorraine's left, Lou DiBella. One of my dearest friends in boxing, Harvard-educated lawyer, boxing promoter, actor. He just told me he's going to be in... Tell us. I just played myself for the second time. I was in Rocky Balboa, but I'm going to be in a movie called Southpaw with Jake Gyllenhaal and uh, Forrest Whitaker. So look out for that one. It's actually, I think it would be a pretty good film. And Forrest Whitaker is amazing. And Lou is the promoter of Broadway Boxing. And, and Heather Hardy. One of the stars of Broadway Boxing. A woman who I've had the uh, pleasure to call most of her fights is, uh, how many fights now? 12 and up. Heather Hardy. Bring your featherweight. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Lorraine, let me start with you since we just watched your movie. Um, how old are the, are the two women now? I'm now uh, 29 and 30. And at that relatively advanced age, they both have, they still have Olympic aspirations. Yeah, absolutely. In the movie, uh, Mary seemed as if she understood why she didn't make it. That, that her victory over her friend was really her Olympic moment. Did you see it that way as it was happening? And what was your emotional reaction when she failed to win a match in, in London? Um, it wasn't obvious to us as filmmakers after she beat Ariane. Um, between uh, the national championships in Canada and the Olympics, it wasn't obvious to, uh, to us that she was struggling. Difficulty in that she had basically spent herself beating, uh, fighting her best friend for the last three years. It was not obvious to us at all. And I don't think it was obvious to her either. It was only in retrospect. I think Clarissa Shields was a huge wake up call for her at Continentals. That certainly came in between um, Nationals and the, and the Olympics. And so she knew that she was going to be facing uh, a new level of boxer at the Olympics that she hadn't necessarily anticipated. But she certainly wasn't. Um, Another question about the movie. What was your involvement as a fan, as a spectator in boxing before you decided to make the movie? Um, I had been training at a boxing club and I'd had about eight fights by the time I made uh, the film, uh, Amateur Fights. And then uh, I got pregnant with my, second, with my first child and decided to make a documentary about the story that I'd heard about just by virtue of being in the boxing community in Canada. Um, and my co-director, she trained at the club, but she uh, she mostly did the work. I just wasn't interested in being competitive at all. Okay. Lou, what do you think? Lou, Lou is a, a, a major supporter of female boxing. We can't say that about all boys. Uh, what would you say the significance of having, even in a very small way, having uh, three weight classes represented in the Olympics? What does that mean for the future of women's boxing? That's a very big positive. Uh, you have to remember, outside of the United States, women's boxing is much bigger. A woman can actually hold down a full-time job as a fighter if she's in Belgium or she's in Germany. Um, there are a number of other countries. Mexico, Argentina. Argentina, right now, yeah, is producing a, a lot of talent and they are supporting women's boxing. Um, you can't really do that in the United States. And Heather's really one of the And actually, Heather's personal training and training boxing. Really, the way she wants to live, and support her daughter the way she wants to live alone, despite the fact that I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, and the reason that these two ladies in Canada, frankly, are going to try to be Olympians in 2016 is because there's no way to make them Olympic. So you might as well go for the Olympics. Right. right. Um, and so, so, yeah, I think the Olympics will help. It's already legitimized the sport to some extent. And the quality of women's boxing is clearly improving. Women deserve the opportunity to fight in the Olympics more weight classes than just three, because it's disgusting that a woman has to move the amount of weight she has to in order to compete. Um, and, and it's frankly 
really starting to irritate me that I can't get a good one. So I have to tell the United States. And I'm going to change that in 2015. Someone's going to pay. Like, like someone, and I mean literally, someone's going to pay. Um, Heather, the woman who won the gold medal in the division that this movie was about was Clarissa Shields, a young girl from Atlanta, I believe. Yeah. Um, Flint, Flint, Michigan. Oh, Flint, Michigan. I'm sorry. Okay. When you see the Olympic dream, is it something you wish you had had because timing didn't work for you in terms of the Olympics? You were a U.S. amateur champion. But in terms of an Olympic medal, what that can do for a fighter, what, how, how do you view that? Did, did you really miss that opportunity? I did miss that opportunity. I didn't start boxing until late 2010. So um, the 2012 Olympics, you had to qualify in 2011. And I was under a year experience. And also, it wasn't my weight class. And I'd given it one shot to compete at 132. And Devin had to feed me about three bottles of water before I got on the scale because in the amateurs, you walk around at your fight weight. So I was about 122 pounds. And they wouldn't let me compete at 132 unless I was over 125. So um, I had competed. And I think I won two fights and lost in the one round and, and lost in the semifinals for Olympic trials. And because of my age and the thought that you don't know how far it's going to go, we said we're just going to turn pro. And frankly, it wouldn't have been the best move for Heather anyway. And, you could, and you know, the number of fighters that I've signed out of the Olympics, like, for, you know, forget about sex, men. And I'm actually speaking about men right now. But um, where I knew going into the Olympics, they weren't going to medal. Because Heather's style is not to touch and move and move and touch and move and score points. Heather's style is to try to beat the hell out of the girl she's fighting. Um, and that's also one of the reasons this documentary you're going to see is so compelling. Um, I think the girl who did it as a student film, Natasha Vern, did a good job. I think uh, I did a pretty good job helping change it to make a better film, but I think she did a very good job. Um, but Heather's story is compelling. Heather is compelling. And Heather's life hasn't been easy. You know? And I've always used the expression, you know, rich kids don't fight, poor kids fight. People fight their way out of something, usually like out of criminality, out of the ghetto, out of jail, out of whatever. Our story is a little bit different because I think in a lot of ways she's trying to fight her way into some things, like a better life for her daughter, but also um, self-esteem. You know, she's had, as we'll see in the movie, I don't want to give away too much of it, but she's had a lot of pretty shitty things happen to her in her life. And, and um, as she says in the movie, fighting actually makes her feel better. And what I think that Heather has fought for, and this is one of the reasons I love her, and this is one of the reasons I want to be a promoter, and I want to make her money, and I want to see her succeed. I love her, and I love her mom, and I love her. But this is like, we're going to pause to do this. She is paused to do this. Um, it's because she's fighting for self esteem, she's fighting for identity. She's fighting because that's who she is. And she's fighting because fighting has allowed her um, to emerge with a much better view of herself than she would have had if she didn't enter. She, uh, she really had a lot of things happen to her in her life that were real punches and stuff beyond. And, and you see that well. And the film's revealing. And she's real honest. And that's what I think makes this movie. What makes the movie is her honesty. Yeah, the, the movie will be following us, Hardy, which Lou is the executive uh, producer of. And very quickly, I just want to remember what, what Lou said. I remember what Heather said to me. I think it was before your first pro fight. I was talking to you the way in. And Heather said, I said, what's your plan? She said, I want to hit the woman so hard that she can't breathe. And I said, okay, she's not that all that different from men boxing. Um, just to backtrack for a second, not to go off track here, but I just want to introduce two people. One is... Uh, a filmmaker, outstanding filmmaker and author, who will have a film uh, in the festival tomorrow. Uh, Brent Jonathan Butler. Brent waves, stand up. Fantastic movie about Guillermo Rigandiao. And uh, Brent lived in Cuba for a while and has remarkable footage and it's an excellent movie. And also, former WBO heavyweight champion of the world, Michael Bent. <laughs> Michael told me earlier today he will be an actor in Michael Mann's next movie, so we look forward to that. But to get back to it, um, the film we just saw was about amateur boxing. Heather, you fought as a pro 12 times. 
what's what's the state of women's boxing in your mind right now? I know that in America it's not where it should be, not where you'd like it to be, and you only have a certain window to operate in, obviously, as a professional boxer. Um, do you have significant hope, real hope, that something big will break? Not necessarily just for you, but for women's boxing professionally. I really do. I think um, the recent popularity of Ronda Rousey and the girls being, um, fighting in MMA and how popular they've become, that they're showing the public that people watch women fights. That's not such a turn off anymore. That people really want to see women fight too. So it's well, just actually, you know, the irony is the women's fights have always done ratings. I mean, I mean, to the extent that they've been put on pay per view cards, or whatever, people like to see women fight. And women sell tickets for fights in local cards. I mean, you know, she's the biggest ticket seller now in the New York area, but it's not like before her. Sonia Lamanakis, who's going to be fighting for a few the women's world heavyweight title, I think, the, I think this weekend, actually, tomorrow. And we wish her the best of luck. She's, she fights for me. But Sonia always had a following. She's a school teacher. She's Muslim. She's a gentle giant. She's um, one of the nicest women you'll ever meet. And her, you know, her, the kids she teaches, their parents will come to her fights. And, and you know, Christy Martin was a ticket seller. Um, you know, unfortunately, years back, though, a woman like Lucia Riker, who's the greatest female fighter I've ever, ever seen, couldn't sell tickets. And a woman I, I, I like very much, Mia St. John, who was a Playboy playmate, and honestly couldn't fight very much because she was a top girl and got better. She took it seriously. And I take nothing away from me. I consider her a friend. But Mia could get on TV back then on pay per view shows because you know, they liked seeing her at the way in. Right? Where you see it was a beautiful woman also, but just a tremendous athlete. Um, could make a living. Lucia Riker, for those of you who don't know, was a million dollar baby. Um, a question for Lorraine. Lou just said that women sell tickets and, and Everybody loves watching women's boxing, but the fact of the matter is there are men, many men, who say, I don't want to see women fight. It does something to me. I don't like the feeling it gives me. It's not appropriate. Now, that may seem like a Neanderthal way of thinking, but nonetheless, it exists. Is it that way in Canada, among Canadian men? And is that a thought that you think is changing with time? Um, gosh, that's a tough question for me to answer. I mean, within the, the immediate boxing club that I am in, the entire national team is made up of, um, of women from Quebec. So, uh, I mean, it, yeah, that's a, sorry, it's a tough question for me to answer. Uh, in my daily life, the people that I interact with, no. But that being said, you can't make a living as a woman, as a professional boxer in Canada. So I think that kind of speaks for itself. Heather, is, is that mentality of, I don't see women fighting, is that something that you hear still yeah. a lot? I have actually a representative from the WBC uh, made a comment about how, you know, I like all you girls, but I'll never uh, stand behind doing this fighting will be wrong. That's great. Lou, do you think that you, someone in such a position, right. you know, this is a boxing still person. Feel that way. Uh, yeah, someone part of the WBC. What if you get shot in Afghanistan to triple fight? And by the way, there's also an innate sexism involved in the fact that we historically stick women in bikinis and make them carry numbers before rounds. And then people are going to say, well, I, uh, I'm fine with that, but I don't want to see a woman fight on Well, hopefully we'll get past the point where... It, it, it but i, I got to be honest, I don't always have this attitude. speaks so much about the dedication that the men suddenly don't have. Guys that are making a million dollars a year will only fight twice a year. Don't stay in shape. Boxing's a disgrace. And it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace that Pacquiao hasn't fought Mayweather. It's a disgrace that you know, the way a lot of the men who are making a fortune treat the sport. Um, 
And, and by the way, like, you know, for example, just a, a slight example, she fought Wednesday night against the woman with a three or five record, who probably got robbed in her last two fights because they were both like split decisions. And you clearly could see that this woman would fight. But this woman with a three or five record showed up and fought her heart and had skill, like had ability, it was not like, a, a, you know, I, I put three and five men in there sometimes with good, with, you know, good male fighters, and I'm like shaking my head going, how did my matchmaker just do that? This woman came to win, and she gave her everything she, she could handle. I mean, Heather won the fight, clearly, but that girl was tough as nails, and then came to me after getting paid, what did she get paid, $1,000? I mean, and like found me after the fight, like thank me profusely for giving her an opportunity. You know, it's got to get better. Lorraine and Heather, I'd like to ask both of you, do you think the motivation for a woman to become a boxer is different than it is for most men? No. Same. <laughs> yeah. And the motivation? Well, I think it's different for everybody. I'm going to disagree with them. Okay. Yeah. Heather, let's hear from oh. you. Wow. Yeah, because in the, for most of the men, it's economic. Yeah. It can be for women, too. As a trainer, it's economic. They're world champions who don't give a shit about their sport. It's very true. Who never stay in shape. I hate a lot of them. I mean, I hate to say this, but I have fighters I promote that I don't root for. <laughs> you know, I mean, for a lot of men, it's purely economic. Right? For the women, and I don't see it that way. It's clearly not that way. Right? A lot of it is... Exactly. There's, there's much more personal pride, passion, self-esteem. There, there are a lot of things that used to sport was the sport of chaos. Factor in what they factor in now. Right. Now there are an awful lot of creeps fighting just for the Well Heather, what what was it? You were looking for something. Oh, I'm so positive early. And and what what was it about boxing that when you first did it or maybe it took a while? Is that Brian Custer over there? Stand up Brian. Brian Custer, my broadcast partner on Broadway Boxing. You know you were here. I apologize. Also on Showtime with me. Hey, Brian, I hope you've come to the tap here for once tonight. Yeah, Lou has a film that's going to be on HBO uh, next week, right? No, De I, I, debuts. When does it debut? Be December 16th. So December 16th on Johnny 16. Tapia, which is, uh, which is an amazing subject to make. And, and, and I have to say, like, I think you're going to like watch this movie. Make sure you don't miss this movie. Be home to watch this movie. But it premieres to, December 16th. It's a great film. Heather, to get back to what I was saying, what was it that clicked with you with boxing? You said either this is my way out or this is my way toward better self-esteem. What was it about this movie? Um, I think after I had my first fight, and I realized that uh, the odds were really against me, but I fought as hard as I could, and it was like the first time in my life where I had a chance to win. No matter how hard you fight, sometimes the life don't really have a chance. But when I fight, I, I really have a chance to win no matter who it is. And, and for those who don't know, Heather's first fight, which was on Broadway Boxing, the very first round of her very first professional fight, she got knocked down. So she got up and she won, and it was a fantastic fight. And she's been undefeated since. You know, so I think something about knockdown and getting up and winning, like really intrigued. Like it, it actually made me far more interested. Because I really won. It wasn't like maybe she didn't win. I really need to go up for like every <laughs> other second of the fight <laughs> from when I got up on. <laughs> Let's take some questions. If anybody has any questions for any of our panelists. are a different breed, okay? Um, there's also a lot of very good people in boxing. I mean, at the highest levels, when you get into professional boxing, there are a lot of creeps, liars, thieves, like go through the list. But when you, on the lower levels, um, there are a lot of saints. There are a lot of people that are dragging young men off the street to keep them from selling crack, to keep them from doing drugs, to keep them in school, to give them self-discipline. So those things do factor in. I agree with you, but a lot of the amateurs, the majority of the amateurs, never make it. And, 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 and it's one of the guys I'm talking about that piss me off are the guys that have the incredible ability, who know it from the time they were a kid, who are treated with kid gloves, who, who, who are treated like they're champions before they accomplish anything, 
and then take for granted the gifts they're given, the huge money they make, and buy twice a year, don't stay in shape, are horrible role models. I go through the list. Let's start with the best fighter in the world. Yes. just introduce Melissa Smith, who has written the book on women's boxing. That's who just asked that question. I'd like to ask a question. Surprise this woman, Priscilla. Priscilla, how are you? Priscilla, I met Wednesday night. Priscilla at BB King's. And it was your first time watching boxing, correct? So as a woman, how did you react to watching Heather's fight? <laughs> She's in love, she said. So you enjoyed it. Sister Linda has a question. She's ten. Yeah. She 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 says she says, Mom, everyone only thinks you're cool because they don't really know you. Oh, that sounds like a daughter. Yeah. Like shut up, Andy. I am cool. You'll you'll meet Heather's daughter in the movie which we're about to see, which is a good segue to wrap up. Um, Lorraine, what can we look forward to for your film? Any uh, future uh, airings? Natasha, the filmmaker, the youngest, if I remember correctly, the youngest graduate of the University of Texas ever. And the youngest and graduate, the graduate of Columbia, Columbia, Columbia Journalism School. School. So it's quite an impressive film debut for the, uh, the filmmaker. So I want to thank you all, and let's get to the movie. Uh, Steve, just one second. We have a special Bob. presentation. 
Um, last year we started our John Garfield Lifetime Achievement Awards. Um, for those, I'm sure you all know John Garfield, the Academy Award nominated actor for Body and Soul. He's been in a number of boxing movies. But he was also a man of character, someone who when the government was throughout the Red, Red, Red Scare trying to take down Hollywood, he stood firm, he stood for his beliefs, uh, he didn't name names when he was asked to testify in front of the Senate. So, um, you know, he was more than just an actor, more than just a guy who portrayed tough guys on film. He demonstrated that in his life. And I can't think of anyone more fitting for that award than Lou DiBella. Um, you guys heard him speak, so you know he's the real deal. Anything I can say about him now will not do justice to what everything he just said. He's a man of character. Um, Heather, if he's behind your cause, you're in really good hands. Um, I've been covering boxing in one way or another for about 20 years. Uh, I've covered his uh, fighters, I've covered his fights, I've, I've written about some of his films. By the way, numerous documentaries. I know he's portrayed himself on the big screen, but he's been the man behind some really fantastic boxing documentaries. Maravilla, Magic Man, uh, Heather's film. Uh, the Tappy the one, the the one that's going to come up on uh, HBO. So. Um, his contributions to both boxing and film are, are amazing and outstanding. And I'll just say one thing, that when you cover major sporting events and you look at your credentials as a journalist, oftentimes it will say on the back, this is a privilege to cover this event. You know, they kind of throw that out there at you. And a lot of times it's not a privilege, but it's always been a privilege to cover Lou. It's been a privilege to be his friend and, and see what he's done for the sport of boxing, not only in New York City, but throughout the world. Um, I, I can't say enough about the, the kind of guy he is and, and the kind of trustworthiness he portrays in a sport where trust is really hard to come by. So um, I can't think of anyone who deserves a, a Garfield Award more than Luke DiBella. I'd like to present it to him right now. Festival. 